if you don't have that natural zest, uh, a desire to do things for other people, not just for yourself and your family, then you can't be a leader. How did Lee Kuan Yew bring Singapore to the pinnacle of success? Everybody knows Singapore as a small but rich country. But what if I tell you that this island was originally inhabited by fishermen and pirates? And it was a really poor country during the 14th century. This island has no natural resources to begin with, so making it a rich country is thought to be impossible. But not with this man, Lee Kuan Yew. If you do some research about why Singapore is an insanely rich country, most likely the answer you will see is the location of Singapore Island. You see, Singapore became a global hub because of its perfect location on the map. You know Singapore is the connection to all countries doing their global trade. That answer is true and no lies within. But the other question that we should be asking is, who made that happen? Who is the man behind the idea of utilizing the location of Singapore to its full potential? Who is this person? Well, that was Lee Kuan Yew. And in today's documentary, we will discuss how he made it. So welcome to Grand Line Media. To help us understand more about how Lee transformed Singapore, let us first have a quick historical discussion about Singapore. Before World War II ended, this island belonged to the British colony. And on September 16, 1963, Singapore became a state of Malaysia, completely ending 144 years of British rule. Actually, there were many things that happened in Singapore way back then. But let's only focus on our main topic, Lee Kuan Yew, and how he became a key to the success of Singapore. Like I mentioned, this island was not yet an independent country in 1963. It was a state of Malaysia because it joined the Federation of Malaysia right after it was freed from the British colony. During that time, there was a political party called PAP, or People's Action Party, led by Lee Kuan Yew, which was the dominant political party during that time. Lee started to serve Singapore as the Prime Minister in 1959. And I want you to remember that he was the first Prime Minister and the first leader of Singapore when it became self-government without being colonized by the British. And we know that in every success story we heard, the most difficult part they always said was the beginning, the first step. That's also the case with Lee Kuan Yew. Because as you know, aside from being a poor country, Singapore also needed to recover after the colonization. And the worst part is that Singapore is just a small island without the richness of natural resources like Malaysia, Indonesia, the Philippines and other neighboring countries that are all rich in those natural resources. So every challenge as a leader of a country you can imagine was on the face of the first Prime Minister Lee Kuan Yew. The first biggest challenge he faced was how to recover from the losses after the colonization. The solution he thought was joining the formation of the Federation of Malaysia, which means Singapore will become a state of Malaysia together with Malaya, Sarawak and North Borneo, or what we know now as Sabah. Anyway, the agreement between Prime Minister Lee Kuan Yew of Singapore and Prime Minister Tunku Abdul Rahman of Malaysia was not quite smooth. Actually, they had thorny issues about the portion of Singapore's revenue and taxes that would go to the federal government. Which means, since Singapore was one of Malaysia's states, they will start giving its portion of income and taxes to the Federation of Malaysia, and in return, Malaysia will now help Singapore in every aspect of financial and other support like the government should do to its states. Well, everything sounds like a plan, right? That was also what Lee was hoping to achieve when he decided to sign the agreement. But everything didn't go according to his plan. Just two years of being under the umbrella of Malaysia, Singapore became an independent and sovereign state on August 9, 1965. What are the reasons for the separation? Well, you guess it. It was the deep political and economic differences between the ruling parties of Singapore and Malaysia that resulted in some tension and racial riots in July and September 1964. So in order to solve this problem, both leaders agreed to let Singapore leave the Federation of Malaysia. It was very hard for Lee, especially since he was a hard believer in the idea of Singapore joining Malaysia. 
He thought that was the right way, but now he had no choice but to separate his nation from Malaysia. So what next? Now that Singapore is an independent country, what was the next step that Lee Kuan Yew took? Well, it turns out that Singapore really needs to stand on its own in order to progress. Look what Singapore has become. Anyway, let's talk about what Lee did after the separation and how it contributed to the current success of Singapore. It's important to note that Lee is a lawyer. He graduated from the London School of Economics and Cambridge University, so his knowledge about politics is surely on another level. And the natural skill of Lee is picking the right people to join his team. You see, during the term of Lee, the corruption rate in Singapore was impressively low. He implemented strict anti-corruption measures, which really helped this country a lot. He established the CPIB, or the Corrupt Practices Investigation Bureau. The CPIB was given extensive powers to investigate cases and prosecute offenders, both private and public officials. And it really had positive results for this country. You see, because of Lee's strong will to fight corruption, Singapore became one of those countries in the world that has the lowest rate of corruption. And as a matter of fact, in 2020, Singapore ranked fourth out of 180 countries in terms of the lowest rate of corruption. But not only that, Lee also implemented this special system called the meritocratic system. The idea is to select government officials based only on their abilities and qualifications rather than their connections and wealth. It means, not like in other countries, that if you're a famous actor or actress or a wealthy person, then you have a chance to become the leader of the country. But Singapore is different. In order for you to serve the country, you need to become qualified in terms of capabilities and educational background. And yes, as expected, that was a great move for this country. Singapore really progressed a lot because of that idea made by Lee Kuan Yew. And that was the starting point for the success of this small country. You know, low corruption means a bright future, and qualified officials mean good governance. And until now, we can still see that Singapore still has those qualified servants that still have the legacy of Lee. Anyway, when it comes to other aspects of Lee's contribution to this country, one of his biggest achievements was his effort to successfully lock down Singapore's long-term supply of water from Malaysia. It was also noticeable his effort to turn Singapore into a lush garden city through island-wide tree planting efforts. There was a vision made by Lee itself that was called the Garden City Vision. He introduced it on May 11, 1967, to transform Singapore into a city with abundant lush greenery and a clean environment in order to make life more pleasant for the people. And again, it was a great move for this country. Singapore really became a green island. And even now, when you visit this country, you will notice that they really invested a lot to make this land a green country. Amazing. Yeah? Amazing. Lee was aware of the negative effects of having different political beliefs on the progress of the economy. So, he set aside the liberal experiments and only prioritized growth, safety, security and equality instead, making all the public servants of Singapore as one with one mission to serve the country. As early as the 1970s, Lee began planning for the future government of Singapore by recruiting and grooming new talent. In 1990, Lee stepped down as prime minister, but he made sure that the next prime minister would have the same vision as him, so he nominated his next successor, Go Chok Tong, who continued his legacies. To make sure that Singapore was still heading in the right direction, Lee remained in politics as senior minister, then as minister mentor in 2004, when his own son, Lee Hsien Long, became prime minister. Anyway, there were so many things that Lee has done for this country, but I guess for me, the most important thing he did was to make sure that his next successor will continue what he started. You see, this is the biggest problem of most of the countries around the world. The projects, the plan, and the vision that the previous leaders started will be stopped if another leader is elected, making the direction of the country uncertain because every leader has a different plan and mission. And the worst part is that those leaders never intended to serve the country in the first place. They are just planning to become wealthy for themselves through corruption. Well, anyway, if all countries have the same leaders as Lee Kuan Yew, Perhaps there will be no third world countries, but instead only well-developed countries like Singapore. 
Lee Kuan Yew passed away on March 23, 2015. But what he had done for Singapore will remain forever.